today as we come to the table. What a statement that is about the things of the Spirit in Esau's life. And see, the question for us is, how important are the things of the Spirit to us? If we were offered a bowl of stew, would we go for it? You know, you've seen the movies and the shows where people talk about, hey, Satan comes and offers somebody, I'll let you have whatever you want if you give me your soul. It's the same idea here. Passing up the eternal pleasures for the temporary pleasures of life. And so he just throws it all away and gives it all away. And it's amazing to me what people will give up for a bowl of stew. I've seen men that will leave a beautiful wife and children for a moment of pleasure. A bowl of stew is all that is. It's a bowl of pottage. Sin can feel good in the moment when you give in when you give in to it. It might even seem like the logical thing to do, and it's definitely the easy choice to make most of the time. However, as Pastor Mark's going to point out with you today, it always leads to regret. It leads you to suffering and missing out on the blessings God has for you. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. God has such amazing blessings in store for you and plans to work through your life, but you have to let him. You have to choose him. He wants you to make the decisions daily to not give in to the pleasures of the world that go against him so he can fully work in your life and do amazing things through you. Now, Let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, with today's edition of Come to the Table. Verse 28, and Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, I can understand the temptation here of Isaac loving Esau more because he had everything a man could want. He was a sportsman, right? And he could cook. I mean, how does it didn't get any better than that? He not only turned the game on, he brought the snacks. That would be a modern day application. And you could see how Dan Sarr would say, that's my boy, right? Love it. That's Esau, right? And yet you could see how Jacob would endear Rebecca's wife because it says that Jacob was kind of around the tent, not necessarily unmanly, but hey, if Rebecca needed something moved, you know, honey, could you park the camels over across the street? Or He was always there to help, right? And also the emotional side, you know, talking and all the things that, you know, I mean, you can see how they would have the temptation, but note this, and moms and dads, I warn us, you're going to have some children who have a personality that's more like yours, and some children who have a personality that's not as much like yours, and you have to be very careful that you don't begin to show favoritism or love one over the other. And it is a tragic mistake that Rebecca and Isaac made here, and I think it affected Esau's life. You see, when you do this, it not only affects the child as far as pain in their heart, but it affects the way they see their brother and sister. They know mom likes that one better. They know dad likes that one better, whatever the case might be. And it causes problems. It causes favoritism. And we need to guard ourselves to make sure that we don't do this. It's very disheartening to a child when a parent or grandparent shows more favor to other children than to them because it says, I love the others better. Now note this. You might say, yes, but my personality is more like that child or more like this one or I can talk to them easier. Biblical love is a choice. It's not a feeling. And it's important that we choose to love all of our children the same. And I think although most parents naturally love all their children, I think sometimes there can be some things that you like more about other children than in others. And so you need to make sure that you guard yourself against that. You know, the last thing I want to do is have my girls growing up thinking, well, dad liked, you know, her more than me or whatever the case might be. I want to say, no, dad was the same. And why is this important? Because that's how our father is. You see, right now we have the heavenly father and he loves each of us the same. He doesn't love one of us more than the other. Now, there may be some of you getting more blessing than the rest of us. Why is that? Simply because you're being more obedient and you're seeking the things of God. But it doesn't mean that God loves you more. And so the bottom line is, is that we need to make sure they know that. Now, personally, I love the different traits and personalities that are in my girls. They're most certainly different. But what I found is, is that each one adds a different flavor to the family. 
And it's almost like all the parts come together to make it complete. You know, Adiah is the one that delegates what everybody's to do. Liel acts it out so we can all see it visually. <laughs> Tolly's planning the next meal and dessert. And Abby's checking everything off on a clipboard. I mean, that's just their personalities. And it makes for a complete family. But you know what? There's some of those traits, and actually there's not really any of those traits that draw me more than another. But let's say there was. I would need to guard myself to make sure that, hey, I really like the way she does. There's nothing wrong in enjoying our children. But make sure that it doesn't turn into a favoritism thing because it can cause great problems. And I think that certainly didn't help in this situation at all. Notice verse 29. Now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And again, now Jacob probably learning to cook from being around where mom did some cooking. And again, there's some great male chefs that are out there. And so Jacob had learned how to cook really well. And Esau comes in, he's he's weary, he's tired. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with the same red stew for I'm weary. And therefore his name was called Edom. Now again, his name is Esau, but it's interesting. Now he gets a nickname. His name is now known as Edom. And by the way, that's what his descendants will be known by as the Edomites as he gathers this new name. And interestingly, the name Edom here means red. So he was hairy and now he likes the red stew. So you got this, as we said, big red, but he's got the nickname here of, of, you know, loving the stew, loving, again, the things of the flesh. And the problem is, is that it passes down to his children. You see, there's something very symbolic here. It's not just that he loved to eat. I mean, I think that, you know, I know I love to eat. And most men do, and and I'm sure that women do as well. God has created us that way. It's a very enjoyable thing. But he was known to be a man of the flesh. He was known to be a man who sought after the things of the flesh. And actually, these characteristics are going to carry on to his descendants, and they're going to be known as the nation of the flesh. And always fighting against the nation of the spirit, Israel. And so, again, it passes on down. And what's my point in this? We need to be warned as parents. You know, the life that we live now is going to pass on to our descendants. If we're living a life of the flesh, we're going to pass on a life of the flesh to our kids. If we're living a life of the spirit, we're going to pass on a life of the spirit to our kids. You know, I heard an amazing statistic just in the last few weeks, and that is this. In households where only one parent is honoring the Lord, note this, they did a specific survey following parents for multiple years. And what they found is, after this study was complete, that in households where moms were the sole spiritual leader, where dad really wasn't into spiritual things, but he was just kind of there, only 15% of the children ended up following the Lord. Note that. But in the households where dad was the spiritual leader, 75% of all those children followed Christ. In other words, even if mom is doing her best and dad is doing nothing, there's a greater chance of losing the kids than not. And if dad simply leads the way, the majority of the kids are going to follow. Why is that? Because God has set it up to do that. We are creatures who look to our father. Not that we don't look to our mother. And I don't want the moms to think, oh, no, it's hopeless because my husband's ungodly and I'm doing my best. No, God can override that. I'm simply saying that statistically, even a father being spiritual and leading, even statistically, we can see it makes a huge impact in the children's lives. And so Esau here now, because of his desire for the things of the flesh, started a nation that desired the things of the flesh and never pulled out of it until God had to destroy them in judgment. Now, it is interesting here in verse 30 when it says, he says, please feed me with that same red stew for I'm weary. And his name became Esau because of that, or Edom rather, which means red. The word feed here literally means to swallow greedily or to devour. And again, it's a picture of someone who is driven by their flesh. It's not just, hey, I want something to eat, but that is the all-important thing in my life. I must have the fleshly things gratified, and he goes for it with great fervor and great devour type of picture here that it gives, aggressively wanting to gratify his flesh and take this stew that Jacob had made. And again, this is often how it is when it comes to the flesh and how it rules our life if we allow it to do so. It becomes something that is this voracious animal. You know, I've I've found about the flesh. I've always heard it, but I've experienced it as well. If you feed the flesh, it only becomes hungrier. Have you noticed that? Feeding the flesh in whatever area, not just, I'm not talking about sitting down having a meal. I'm saying, you know, you eat the meal and right afterwards, you know, you're feeling better. But whenever you allow the indulgences of the flesh, and many of them before God are fine in proper balance, but whenever you allow the flesh just to run loose, you can't satisfy it. It's never satisfied. It always wants more. And that's exactly what Big Red finds out here. What Esau finds out is that, you know what? He's not satisfied. He's got to have more. And so it's important for us to realize that if we start down that path, where does it end? 
Well, he devours, he wants to devour the stew, he tells Jacob. And notice, but Jacob said, and again, Jacob being very wily and very smart, and rather than letting God in his timing work it out, Jacob now takes things in his own hands. And notice he says, sell me your birthright as of this day. Now, what's interesting about that is, understand, the birthright was huge. We could read that and think, all right, your birthright, big deal. What does that mean? So you want to say that you were the one that has preeminence over me. Understand. It had to do with, number one, family inheritance. Whoever had the birthright got double inheritance. It had to do also with a family position. You were seen as the one in authority. If dad was to die, you were the one to lead the family. You were the one that took things over and watched over the family. But more importantly than that, in Abraham's line, this meant the Abrahamic covenant was carried on through you. And what is my point in that? That means this. God had promised whoever had the birthright through their bloodline would come the savior of the world. What an honor. He's saying, look, in the genealogy of heaven, your name will be written as one of those that was chosen to be in the line of the savior of the world, which we now know as Jesus the Christ. So this was huge. It should have been a huge badge of spiritual pride saying, wow, I get to be the one. What an honor this is. And instead of looking at it as something that was an amazing honor to him, It's worth trading a bowl of stew for. What a statement that is about the things of the Spirit in Esau's life. And see, the question for us is, how important are the things of the Spirit to us? If we were offered a bowl of stew, would we go for it? You know, you've seen the movies and the shows where people talk about, hey, Satan comes and offers somebody, I'll let you have whatever you want if you give me your soul. It's the same idea here. Passing up the eternal pleasures for the temporary pleasures of life. And so he just throws it all away and gives it all away. And it's amazing to me what people will give up for a bowl of stew. I've seen men that will leave a beautiful wife and children for a moment of pleasure. A bowl of stew is all that is. It's a bowl of pottage. I've seen women, because their husband's not romantic enough, run off with someone who they think is going to speak romantic to them, and it dies after a month or two, and now they realize they've ruined their life for a bowl of stew. Guys, listen, when we make decisions for things of the flesh, it's nothing but a bowl of stew. It's a temporary pleasure that is going to run out, and we're going to be hungry again. And I can promise you, it will never satisfy what it is we're looking to be satisfied with. It won't do it, because that only comes by the things of the Spirit. I have never found anything of the flesh that has satisfied me that I said, you know what? That's all I need. I'm satisfied now. Maybe temporarily thinking that, but as time goes on, it wears out. And that's exactly what is going to happen here with Esau. He thinks, you know what? This is going to satisfy me. I'm going to go for it. And then what happens in Esau's life? Once he goes, you know, it goes from red to dead, from hot to cold and from new to old. And that's exactly what happens when we go after these things. And a bowl of stew can look so good when you're starving emotionally or physically. But once you're emotionally or physically satisfied, so to speak, for the moment, you're going to regret the decision for the rest of your life. It destroys. It ruins. Because, again, nothing can do it except the spirit. There's nothing else that satisfies. Now, another thing to note here about Jacob and Esau, and we've really already taken note of this, is it's interesting here. They were both hungry but for different things. You see, Esau was hungry for the things of the flesh and Jacob was hungry for the things of the spirit. And he realizes, you know, I'm going to take advantage here. I'm I'm going to take his birthright and he's able to take advantage of Esau in this moment of weakness here. But again, why was Esau in a moment of weakness? Because Esau had allowed himself to get to a place where the flesh was more important than the spirit. And this is where we need to take note. Listen, when people fall in sin, it doesn't happen overnight. I have never met one person in my life that was walking strong with the Lord and all of a sudden, just all of a sudden blew it in one day. Some cute secretary walks up or some smooth talking man or whatever the case might be or somebody shoves a six pack in their face and that used to be their past. Whatever the case might be, I've never seen somebody walking with the Lord tight just all of a sudden fall off the end. How does it happen? Gradually. It's a slow process. We begin to open the door to things we shouldn't have them open to. You know, hanging out with people we shouldn't hang out with, reading things we shouldn't read, watching things we shouldn't watch, talking about things, entertaining thoughts in our mind that we never used to entertain after we came to the Lord. And the next thing you know, now we find ourselves down a path that when the temptation walks up, we're ripe for the picking. Our job is to make sure that we guard ourselves so that when those situations come up, we're ready. And I've said it before, and I want to say it again, we're all going to be tempted. Every one of you in here in this room, you're going to be tempted in some area where you have a weakness, guaranteed. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The question is, when the temptation comes your way, are you going to be able to stand or not? And depending on how you're living today is going to determine that. If you're living according to the Spirit and you're staying close to the shepherd, when the strong winds come and the storms blow, you're going to grab onto his leg tighter and you're not going to go anywhere. 
But if you're walking right on the edge, I'm not going to fall off. I'm just looking over the edge, wondering what it's like down there. What happens when that strong gust of temptation comes along and you're right at the edge? It'll blow you over. And see, Esau had done this. He had lived a life of seeking after the things of the flesh rather than seeking after the things of the spirit. And so the good news for us is that we can change that at any moment. We can say, hey, I'm not going that route anymore. I want to repent and I want to come back. And so that is exactly what we need to do if we find ourselves in that position today. And I wish that is what Esau had done, but he didn't. Now, I want to make one other note about the birthright before we move on and and finish this passage today. But it's important to note that the birthright was not just the first one who was born. The birthright represented the person in authority. Now, we mention that, but oftentimes... Even those that weren't the firstborn were called the firstborn because God put them in that position of authority. I think of King David. David was eighth down the line, and yet he was called the firstborn, put above his brothers because David had a heart after God. Manasseh and Ephraim, the same thing. One was put above his older brother because he was seeking after the things of God. Jacob and Esau, the same thing. Now, why is that important? Simply for this reason, because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. And there are some who have mistakenly believed that that somehow means that Jesus was created. No, the Bible says that Jesus not only was not created, Jesus was the creator. In Colossians 1.16, it says this, For by him, that is Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Well, again, this is what has misled the Jehovah's Witness. They believe that because of the passage of Jesus being the firstborn, that means he was a created being. Not at all. What it means is he was in the position of authority and he was preeminent. And so that is what now God has done with Jacob. And Jacob, again, trying to help him out by doing it in his own strength. And notice here Esau's response, verse 32. Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? In other words, I'm starving to death. Who cares about being in the line of the Messiah? What a sad statement. And again, we see the state of Esau because of how he had been living his life according to the flesh. And now when the true test came along to find out whether or not he would stand, he wasn't able to stand and didn't even want to stand. And that's the saddest thing. He didn't even desire to. And so notice he says, hey, I don't care about this. What's that to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So now he's going to trick him out of it again, grabbing that heel again. And notice, so he swore to him and he sold him his birthright. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank and arose and went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. Note several things here. First of all, he ate it, meaning again, the word means he devoured it. Again, it was this fleshly lust that was fulfilled for that moment, something he just had to have. It attracted him, drew him in by his eyes, and he thought it would be good to the taste. And indeed it was the same type of temptation that Satan had in the garden, and he grabs it and swallows it down. And again, what's sad about this is that this one decision solidified the course of his life from this point on. You might say, but wait a minute, Mark, he was already a fleshly man. Yes, he was. But he made the decision that solidified that by saying, I don't want the things of God. Forget it. I'm going for it in the flesh. Now, here's where we can be warned. Maybe right now you're saying, you know what? As I hear about Jacob and Esau, I'm a lot like Esau. I'm really more like Esau than Jacob, actually. And sometimes I don't think I even really, not only are my priorities out of line when it comes to the things of God and the things of the flesh, I don't really even have that great of a desire for the things of God. I mean, I really don't care that much if I were to be honest with everyone. Listen, here's the good news. If that's where you are, God can change that. But you have to admit it. Go to the Lord and tell him. Don't sit back and say, I really don't care about the things of God, so I'm going to write it off like Esau did and make that fatal decision. Go to God and say, all right, God, I know that you're supposed to be first in my life, but I've got a lot of other things that come before you, and I prove that by the way I live my life and my priorities, but I don't want it to be that way. And so I ask now that you would change me, touch my heart. God will be faithful to do that. If you will ask him, he will be faithful to do it. You know, we sang that song at the very beginning, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. If you don't have that love for the Lord, listen, don't fret about it. Say, God, change me. Ask him, give me a heart that loves you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. God will be faithful to do that. It's not a matter of playing games and pretending we're someone we're not. God wants us to be honest and come before his throne and say, change me. I want to be this way. And yet we see that Esau didn't do that. He made a life decision here that sent him in a spiraling down in in an irreversible direction. 
But notice it's also interesting to me here. It says, after he had done this, he despised his birthright. You know, it reminds me of one of David's sons when he raped his own sister. It says that he loved her so much that he raped her. And of course, the word love there is not really the word that gives the full picture there. He lusted her so much that he raped her because true love would have never done that. But once he was done, he despised her. And see, here's the trick where Satan chews us up and spits us out. He makes it look so good on this side of it. Oh, it just seems so wonderful. I mean, wow, smell that stew. And wow, that looks good. And man, I really am hungry. And I don't care. And nothing's going to stop me. Hey, do you realize the foolish decision you're making here, Esau? I don't care. What does it matter? This drives you. And then what does he do? He blows it. And now he despises it. And that's exactly what happens in the sin life. Whenever we throw away the things of the spirit for the things of the flesh, we're going to realize how foolish we've been and end up despising it. How many people at the end of their life say, I've wasted my entire life in foolishness. They despise the choices they've made because they've not made wise choices and it leaves them empty. And again, they end up distancing themselves from the very thing they should be drawing to, and that is the things of God. And that's what Esau has done here. You know, it's interesting, the cunning hunter or trapper has now himself been trapped by his fleshly appetites and destroyed. We need to guard ourselves to keep that from happening. You know, as we see a passage like this, listen, any one of us can point out areas that we need to be more serious about God in. But I think what we need to ask ourselves is this, are we slowly being trapped? You know, I read yesterday there was a particular alligator down in Florida. They've been trying to trap for two years. Maybe you saw it on the news. He's been in this pond and the best trappers couldn't get him. This guy was just sharp. And finally yesterday or the day before, whatever day it was, they set up the trap and finally he walked right into the trap. You know what? I don't know how much alligators can think or not, but what a beautiful picture that is of how many of us think that we are in our sin. We think we can just swim in the lake of sin forever and stay right on the edge. And you know what? We're never going to get trapped. It's never going to take us. It's never going to control us. And all it takes is one day of one wrong move and we find ourselves in a cage that is closed behind us and we're now the trapped. The hunter becomes the hunted. And that's exactly what happened to Esau. Listen, we need to check our hearts today and make sure that we are not on a slow, steady process that will lead us to the place of no return like Esau. And the question is, are we living after the things of the spirit or after the things of the flesh? Again, what's the balance? Listen, we have a lean toward the things of the spirit. We want the things of the spirit, but we struggle in some things of the flesh. That's very different in living for the things of the flesh and struggling to have some of the spirit in our life. You ever seen people like that? It's like they're living so much according to the flesh that, you know, anything to do with God is a struggle. It should be the opposite. We should be living so much for God that the things in the flesh, you know, the things we struggle with from time to time, but they don't dominate our life. And again, the difference here to note as we finish today's passage is this. It all came down to choices. We are faced with choices. And maybe the Lord is laying out a choice in front of you right now saying, all right, you know what? You've got some issues that I'm talking to you about and I've been talking to you throughout this teaching and now you need to make the right choice. Here's the spirit, here's the flesh. Which one are you gonna take? In Deuteronomy, God says, choose life and I will bless you. Choose death and you will be cursed. Guys, my appeal to you is let's choose life. And again, if you don't even have a desire to choose it, let God know right now. As we end, say, pray to the Lord and say, God, I don't really have the desire I know I should for the things of you, but change my heart. Give me a heart that does desire it and watch what God will do. God will be faithful and God will change your heart. It's always a blessing to have you come to the table of God's word with us each and every day. Pastor Mark's been going through the book of Genesis and there's much to learn and appreciate from this first book of the Bible. Sometimes to fully grasp something later on, you need to understand where things began. From verse one, God made it clear that he was there all along and he set things in motion exactly as he instructed. Isn't it neat to see that all of creation is under God's authority? That includes you. This could seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually God's way of looking out for your best interests. Once you look at it that way, you start to realize that everything in all of creation is something that God initiated with intention, and that includes you. What a great thing to come to today. If you missed any part of this message or would like to hear this one again, you can always go back and find it at thewaymedia.net. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. Another way to access these messages is by downloading the Way Media app from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. By doing this, you'll be able to take these teachings with you wherever you go. Would you like to get in touch with us? 
Our number is 865-609-1385. Once more, that's 865-609-1385. Feel free to call us with questions or to even ask for prayer. Please come back for another edition where Pastor Mark will continue his teaching through the book of Genesis. But next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary, Knoxville.